Well, what the Victoria Amplifier is, I think, is a great American story. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the only reason that, let me put it this way, this business found me. I, I did not wake up one day and say, you know what, I think I'm going to start this business and build guitar amplifiers. It's something that absolutely found me. I was a stockbroker, right? you know, and before that I was a failed geologist. You know, I got a degree in geology, a lot of good that. You're from me. Chicago, Mark? Yeah, I grew up in Naperville. Okay. Yeah. So this is your home turf. And you yeah. started Victoria in the early 90s? Mid-90s, mid-90s, 1994. So right around when I met you. Yeah, right. exactly. Year after. Uh -huh. Oh, I remember going to see you at Buddy Guy's Club, like, before, actually, I got into any of this. Mm -hmm. What I did was I decided to get back into playing guitar. You know, I played guitar in college at the University of Iowa and, of course, through high school. It's always uh -huh. been my, my, my one passion has been, you know, music and guitar. Right. You know, my, my parents discouraged me to the point that it wasn't going to be a vocation for me, you know, I th so I thought. So anyway, um, I, I had a real gig. I was a stockbroker, making a lot of money downtown, getting up at five in the morning, coming home when the sun is down, you know. Yeah. And um, I decided I was gonna take guitar back up. And because of that decision, I, 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 I decided I wanna buy a new guitar for the first time in my life. Maybe I should put it that way, you know. I, my entire life I used used instruments and had acquired, you know, some old vintage guitars and some old vintage amps. I said, you know what, fuck it, man. I'm gonna go buy a brand new guitar and amp. And I went to Guitar Center and I bought a brand new Stratocaster and a brand new reissue basement. And I brought the things home and I plugged them in and I listened to the, I, I had an actual 410 basement from the day. Really? That was an old beat up one. 59. It was a 60. Uh -huh. And it was all beat up and I thought it was a piece of junk. I mean, I bought it for 200 bucks when I was in college, okay? Because mm -hmm. I couldn't afford a blackface Fender. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the one that nobody wanted. It was $200. I was like, I'll take that one. And when I compared the new Fender to the old one, I was astonished at the difference that I heard. Mm -hmm. The old one sounded so much better, and I expected the exact opposite. You know? yeah. The only reason I bought the new amp is because I was going to make a point to myself. Like, I've got this money, and I'm going to buy a new, for the first time in my life, mind you, a new rig. And when I realized that the stuff that was available as new, even from, you know, the namesake company of guitar amps, you know, Fender, their new products were not as good as their old ones. Mm -hmm. And it was that epiphany that kind of led me on the journey to understand first why. And then having satisfied that intellectual, you know, query, mm -hmm. you know, I, that's when everything just kind of came. I started this company because I wanted to know, you know, just for my own intellectual satisfaction, why this old one was so much better than the new one. It was just a curious thing. Because, if, and you'll remember this, Dave, when those things came out, there was a lot of media attention given to the, the Fender 410 basement reissue. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a big event in music gear, guitar gear circles. And uh, I mean, every magazine was lauding it as the most important new amp since the basement, you know, in 1960, blah, blah, blah. So here was this event and this, this amp that had all this you know, notoriety associated with it, and it really wasn't doing it for me. So it was just figuring it out. And the journey you know, led me to you know, building one that was correct, led me to building the very number one, which was one of these. So did you take the basement reissue apart and start tweaking it? Not that one. I did eventually, but not at first. Uh -huh. I mean, a lot of things happened happen coincident to this, kind of this, this you know, idea in my head. You know, I, I met a guy at a guitar show who had manufactured exact tweed replica chassis, but not of the basement. He manufactured the tweed supers. Mm -hmm. It was some guy at a guitar show who was trying to sell them. And he was having trouble selling them because they didn't have any silk screening on them. But, I mean, it, it was one of these things. I'm thinking about, I'm, I need to build my own amp. I need to, you know, this doesn't look that difficult. And again, coincident to this whole happening, was um, Aspen Pittman, who started the company Groove Tubes. Mm -hmm. Aspen Pittman came out with a book called The Tube Amp Book. Mm -hmm. And it really opened guitar players' eyes as to the you know, possibilities of the vacuum tube and what the vacuum tube means to your sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, Aspen came out with that book. I bought that book. It was like mm -hmm. a Bible, you know. Sure. Two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. All I did was make Fender Tweet Supers, Tweet Bandmasters, Tweet Pros, Tweet Basements. Tweet twins. That's all I made were those tweets. And the reason I was able to do it is because I was a typical customer. It turns out that my, you know, what I was looking for at Guitar Center 
uh, what a surprise. I wasn't the only guy looking for this kind of thing. Sure. It turns out that my desires as a consumer were honestly representative of the broader public. You know, So when I made these amps, all I had to do to be successful at first was to convince the public that I'd done it correctly, which I have. Now, to, to, to the end that I did it correctly, it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I, I have no formal education in electronics. You know, I was a geology major. Um, I think that lack of formal education is what gave me the ability to replicate the product correctly. Because it, 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 it allowed me to start without any preconceived biases mm -hmm. about electronic components and, and, and their value and, and, and how they work in the circuit. So what I was endeavoring to do was to copy an old Fender exactly. Right. And when I opened up the new Fender and compared the two of them, there was one obvious difference. The new one was on a printed circuit board. And the old one was all these individually soldered components. Right. Hand wired. Hand wired rather than being on the PC board. Now to what extent, you know, to what can you say one resistor of the PC board or the type of wire they're using, how does that affect the overall thing? You know? It's tough to say. Is it one percent, five percent? But the salient point is that the type of resistor that was being used, I mean the actual type of resistor. Uh, an old style carbon resistor versus a new style metal resistor. I mean, the, the, the little new style resistor was this big, you know, and it fit on that printed circuit board. Now, the old ones are like this big, and they're big fat things, you know? Could you just explain what a resistor does? A resistor is one of the main components in a passive electronic circuit. You got resistors, capacitors, and that's basically it. Uh -huh. Resistors and capacitors, that's electronics. A resistor um, simply impedes the flow of electrons. It's resistance, it resists, it acts to resist the flow of electrons. And the value of a resistor, you know, can be anything from, you know, a short circuit, zero, to a million ohms. I mean, typically, there, in, in many parts of this circuit, we use resistors that are two and a half million ohms in resistance in, 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 in the Golden Melody. Uh, mm -hmm. in the biggest one I come on, no, in, 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 in that Tweed Super, there's a 10 million ohm resistor. You know, so they could be any. But anyways, the type of resistor that was being employed in the new product was a different type. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know what, I didn't know the names of them, mm -hmm. but I knew they looked different. You know, so that, okay, that's one thing to figure out. Note self, figure out what this is all about. Yeah. And, and I did that for every component in the amp. I mean, even the on-off switches, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much anything that I could. Now, what I found out is when I went out to go buy resistors, I found out you couldn't buy the old kind of resistors anymore. They were unavailable. And literally, I, I, there was no supplier that, that, that supplied them. So what I had to do was have them made. I mean, I called up. I found out that the resistors that were made, that were used by Fender, were made by a company by the name of Allen Bradley. Still a company that's around. Uh, they're now Rockwell International. Mm -hmm. so. Anyway, I made a lot of phone calls and bothered a lot of people at Allen Bradley. Yeah. And they finally got me to a sales guy who agreed, said, OK, you want these resistors? We'll make them for you. We're going to need minimum orders per piece of 10,000 pieces per value. Wow. How many resistors going to one amp? Well, there's probably 30 different values. Mm -hmm. Well, I was young and dumb and full of money. I was still a stockbroker now. I had not quit my day game, okay? I was still working as a full time stockbroker. So we had the resistors made. I said, okay, make, make them, make, yeah. make the resistors. He's like, okay, we'll do it. And I'm still using, by the way, Resistors in your amplifier yeah. were made for me back in 1995 by Alan Bradley. And I bought a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of resistors to get the values that I needed. And when I did that, you know, I was, I, I was literally buying uh, of some values. I've got 50,000 or more. 100 Ks, I bought 100,000 resistors. So that's, that's a lot. It's enough to build a lot of amplifiers. Yeah. What about tubes, Mark? Finding. You know, wow, well, new tubes or old tubes that were, you know, <coughs> what they used back in the day, say in a 59 basement or else. Well, the American uh, tube manufacturing stopped basically in 1976. That was the real death knell. Mm -hmm. That's when RCA closed their plant in New Jersey. Um, the, other, the, the other plants, General Electric and Sylvania, kept making tubes until the late 90s, but the glory days were gone when RCA closed that plant. Uh, vacuum tubes are an antiquated technology. 
uh, not very environmentally friendly in this day and age, I must say, because it's a very, it, it, it's a thermionic device in that it has to get hot in order to work. So not too green, they're hot, they're red, baby. <laughs> uh, vacuum tubes are still used in industrial applications in the third world and in Russia, in China. So when the USA um, ceased the manufacture of tubes, the remaining uh, demand for them was satisfied by the plants in Russia and China. And to this day, those, those plants are still making tubes. The one in Russia, they threaten to close that one down every five years, and uh, it, it, it doesn't happen. I think Mike Matthews of New Sensor. Uh, actually, an American owns that plant in Russia, by the way. The guy for uh, uh, electroharmonics. You guys heard electroharmonics stuff? Uh, his name is Mike Matthews. He owns that plant in Russia. And, uh, He's got some stories about dealing with Russian businessmen. But, um, <laughs> so the, the tubes are available, and it didn't present an impediment to my making the amps back in, back mm -hmm. in, in the beginning. Uh, it was really, back in 1995, the tubes were pretty plentiful. Sure, old stock and, tubes. And old stock tubes. And, and my original amps, I endeavored to uh, include old stock tubes in them, mm -hmm. and I was able to do it. It's a hell of a lot harder to do it now. But, 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 but as far as the tube thing goes, I, I, I worry more about the future of the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when the salesman from Electroharmonics calls me and says, hey, you know, you better put an order in because we're going to go to a work shutdown over there. You never know if the plant's going to you know, close forever or what. Okay. The last time that plant almost closed, it was because some Russian businessmen wanted the real estate to build a resort. It's on some you know, nice property with this huge factory. They wanted to make it into condos and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Mike Matthews had to uh, fight them off. I'm sure he had to pay somebody off to keep the thing open. But what they were doing, here's the interesting thing, what the Russian government did to try to squeeze Mike Matthews was they shut down his oxygen supply. Evidently, to make tubes, you need ultra pure oxygen. And he had it piped in special. And they cut it off. And he couldn't make his tubes because he didn't have the correct type of oxygen to because they need a lot of it, you know, to mm -hmm. do whatever they do. I, don't, I mean, I, I'd love to see how those they're made. 